COVID-19 analytics talks organized and sponsored by the Informs Richmond Tidewater chapter and the Masters of Decision Analytics alumni um, who are graduated, graduates of this um, comprehensive data analytics weekend program designed for working professionals, um, much like many of you and myself. Um, if you're interested in INFORMS, um, which is the Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences, uh, you can find more information at informs.org. Um, but today, I'm happy to introduce our third COVID talk speaker today, Dr. Fern Halper. Uh, Dr. Halper is VP and Senior Research Director for Advanced Analytics at TWDI, um, or Transforming Data with Intelligence. Uh, this is a company that works directly with data leaders and teams worldwide to enhance their data management and analytics projects. Uh, Dr. Halper is here today to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on data and analytics professionals, as well as the future of, anal future of analytics. And she is certainly equipped to lead this topic uh, with over 20 years of experience in analytics and strategy development, including being a partner at a consulting firm, uh, Hurwitz and Associates, uh, focusing on cloud computing and advanced analytics, uh, leading data efforts at AT&T and Lucent Technologies, and development of approaches to analyzing marketing and operational data at Bell Laboratories. Uh, and she also has many fans of her publications on big data, cloud computing, hybrid cloud, and others, including uh, Balin, who was our last host, uh, who has enjoyed big data for dummies. <laughs> Um, like, enough of my talk, talking, I guess. Uh, one more quick note. Uh, you'll be muted throughout this entire presentation. However, you can send questions at the Q&A down at the bottom of the screen, and we'll address these at the end. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Halper. Great. Thanks, Dana. Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, this talk on the impact of COVID-19 on data and analytics uh, professionals. We know you're busy and really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. So here's what I'm gonna talk about. I'll start, get started with just a very brief introduction on TDWI, just for those of you who aren't familiar with um, the company. But I'll start off, I'll talk about the state of data and analytics in 2020. I wanna sort of set the stage in terms of where we've been before I talk about how COVID-19 is, is impacting all of this. And so I'll spend some time talking about the state of data and analytics in 2020, you know, where we are, what the challenges are. And then I'll talk about a survey that we ran in 2020 in April, the April, May timeframe at TDWI about how COVID-19 is impacting the profession, the data and analytics profession. And from that, I wanna talk about how to pivot and what some guiding principles are for success as organizations move forward in this new normal. So a lot to cover here. Let's see if, so just in terms of TDWI, uh, this is an overview of what TDWI is all about. We've been around for 25 years. We offer training for um, professionals. Now it's, we've had to pivot too, so now it's, um, a lot of it is virtual training. We have online training, we have online summits, we have on-site education, which is now virtual education. We even have a certification, the Certified Business Intelligence Professional. And I'll draw your attention to research and resources because that's my team. We have a, a group of expert analysts who generate cutting edge research and, and tools. So we do a lot of market research about what's happening in the data and analytics space, everything from data management to AI. I personally cover a lot of the advanced analytics um, technologies and what's happening out there with that. So our courses cover everything from dimensional modeling, you know, to, to AI and the research covers um, that as well. So that's a little bit about TDWI. Let's talk about the state of analytics in 2020. And again, this will be a backdrop for how I want to talk about what's happening with COVID-19. So not surprisingly, at TDWI, we do a lot of research. As I mentioned, we do a lot of market research. And every year, we run a survey about data and analytics. We run this at the end of the year, and then um, it starts at the end of the year, and it goes to the beginning of the year. And so in 2020, we asked the same question that we asked um, in previous years, which is, which statement best describes your organization's maturity with analytics? And you could see here that there are five um, different bars 
there's, we use primarily spreadsheets for analysis. Then the orange bars, we use uh, dashboards and reports. The green is that they've moved to maybe self-service visual analytics, something like a Tableau or a Click type of um, product. The brown one is you know, moving into predictive analytics and machine learning. And then if they're moving past predictive analytics and machine learning, that's that little yellow bar there. So maybe they're using some other AI technologies such as natural language processing. But you could see that in the beginning of 2020, slightly less than half of the respondents to our survey were dealing um, with relatively immature analytics. And I should say that um, it should have the, the number of respondents are about 100 uh, for this one, but this is typically what we see anyway. So slightly half uh, we're dealing with relatively immature analytics. Those are the two bars on the left there, the 22 and the 25%. So I'm calling relatively immature technologies, things like spreadsheets, dashboards, and reports. Another quarter, we're moving into this self-service analytics phase where they were doing self-service visualization, slicing and dicing, and data discovery. And then the rest, about a third, have moved into predictive analytics and machine learning or beyond um, with about 32%. You can see those right bars there using predictive analytics and machine learning. So either using open source tools or commercial tools. And this is what we typically see anywhere between about 30 to 40% of respondents to our surveys are in the early mainstream, what I'd say of adoption of predictive analytics and machine learning. Um, another way to look at this is to look at some of the priorities that organizations have for 2020. Again, this is part of that same survey. And in it, we asked, what are your biggest priorities for analytics in 2020? And the biggest priority was self-service analytics. And self-service analytics not only includes the technology that I was just talking about in terms of data visualization, it sort of goes across the whole analytics lifecycle. You can also see that number three down there is data literacy with about 40 something percent saying that data literacy was um, important as well. And data literacy and self-service go hand in hand with each other. So at TDWI, when we talk about data literacy, it's not just about the data and the data definitions. Um, we talk about data literacy in terms of involving how well users understand and can interact with data and analytics and then communicate the results to achieve business goals. You know, so that includes the data, but it also includes understanding the business, framing analytics, critical interpretation of the output of your analytics, and being able to communicate what the output actually means. So you could see that why data literacy and self-service would go hand in hand there. You could see automation is also really important, and I'll talk about automation more in a few minutes as well as things like upskilling business analysts. We see many organizations looking to upskill their business analysts to become more sophisticated and do more sophisticated analytics, like you guessed it, you know, machine learning, which is number five here on this list in terms of uh, priority. So you know, what we're seeing then is that organizations um, are, are building their self-service capabilities. They're also looking forward to be doing predictive analytics and machine learning. But in our education surveys, when we look to see what people are interested in being educated on, predictive analytics and machine learning, which is this PAML thing I have here, that ranked number five, ranked number one, sorry, in terms of education. So organizations are really interested in this. And in fact, the demand for predictive analytics and machine learning just continues to increase. Um, in the same survey, 71% said, said that demand was actually increasing. That was up from 64%. Uh, last year. So um, organizations that do move forward into predictive analytics and machine learning, they are reaping the rewards. We particularly see that those organizations that are doing more advanced kinds of analytics are able to measure a top or bottom line impact. They're more likely to do that than organizations that are sort of um, back on the technology spectrum. And these projects these predictive analytics and machine learning projects are being found across the whole organization. This is from a survey that we did in, in 2019. But in it, we asked, uh, where is AI, which AI in today's parlance actually really means 
machine learning, maybe some natural language processing, but most people, when they answer this question, are thinking about machine learning. Where is it being used in the business today? And the red is currently in use, and the gray is planned for use in the next few years. And you could see that it's being used across the organization. It's being used in IT and operations, um, popular use cases. There are things like predictive maintenance to actually determine if a, a part will fail. But it's even being used in customer service, another popular area. We often see that marketing customer service are some of the early adopters of some of this technology. But if you go all the way down on the list, it's even being used in places like in parts of the organization, like in HR, you know, in terms of determining employees that will churn. And what we also see is that um, organizations that are using predictive analytics and machine learning, they may have a couple of products projects in production. So they may have built a number of models, but in terms of the number of models that are actually in production running, say scoring or customers who are going to churn or some sort of recommendation engine, you know, that's using predictive analytics, you know, something that's sort of ongo ongoing operationalized in the business, predicting fraud, um, you know, analyzing customer behavior, doing market basket analysis, or, you know, something that's sort of ongoing. There's typically only about two to five um, projects in production. And we see that telecom and high tech and internet are very um, popular industries where um, individuals are using these types of technologies. Industries like government, education um, are, are lagging, actually, some of the other industries, sorry to say. And but industries like healthcare, you know, were also lagging, but now, you know, they're starting to catch up. And especially with COVID-19, they're doing more forward-looking um, work. We're also seeing at TDWI that open source is pretty popular for machine learning. And in fact, what we see is that majority of organizations do plan to use open source for their analytics efforts. So in this survey, which is from the same survey from 2019, we asked what open source tools does your organization use for analytics or use for analyzing data? You know, please select all that apply. And you could see that Python and R are two of the really popular um, techniques here. And then for deep learning, some organizations are using TensorFlow and, and there's other tools down there as well. And so organizations um, like open source because it's low cost. It has some of the latest algorithms. Um, it's very attractive to coders and, and this sort of next generation of data scientists that are, are coming out of university who are being trained on tools like R and Python, as opposed to commercial tools. Um, there's fast development and a lot of people like the fact that there's no vendor lock-in. So what we're seeing is that even those organizations that don't have more advanced analytics in place right now, or I should say the right now, right before COVID-19, they um, think that they're going to be using open source tooling and R and Python are leading the way. And in fact, there's been a flip here, you know, where in previous years we saw that R was more popular than Python. Now Python is becoming more popular than R. And of course, you know, people are coming out of university and they're, they're trained um, on this. So that's um, one trend that is interesting. Um, a trend that's maybe important in the COVID world is also is about automated machine learning and automation. Remember, if you remember back to that previous slide, I showed you automation was in the top three in terms of priorities, in terms of what organizations want to do. And of course, automation, you know, can be that, that can be automation of, of anything. Um, across the whole data and analytics life cycle. What I'm showing here is this new trend in terms of automated tooling, what's sometimes known as augmented intelligence or smart tooling. And um, here we said, which type of augmented tooling do you plan to use? And we have th three types that we're mentioning here that we see a lot of interest in a TDWI. Uh, we see automated machine learning, automated data quality, and automated insights. So automated machine learning provides an easy way uh, for organizations to build machine learning models. So this gets back to this upskilling and being productive um, piece that I was talking about before in terms of priorities. In automated machine learning, what happens is that the tool actually can 
automatically generate a number of machine learning models um, and then pick the best one. Basically, all you do is you provide the input to the model. So you might provide a target variable of interest. So say if it's a churn model, you might provide something like, you know, a classifier like churn or no churn. That's a very simple example. But then you have all the attributes along with that. It goes into this automated machine learning tool. Think tools like Data Robot or H2O AI. Um, and then they automatically generate the best machine learning model. And the lack of skilled data scientists and productivity considerations are leading organizations to, to think about utilizing tools like automated machine learning. And you can see here, likewise, you know, there's automated machine learning, there's automated DQ, which is automated data quality, which gets at the garbage in, garbage out issue um, with analytics. So these tools have machine learning and other algorithms operating behind the scenes to be able to ferret out um, you know, problems with, with the data. Then there's auto insights, which is where machine learning and other advanced tools operate behind the scenes to surface insights. So you might log into your, um, you know, Looker or some, some tool, IBM has some of them, you know, where, and SAS, where you, you, you go in and automatically you see some insights. This is great for business users, maybe who, you know, aren't that skilled with analyzing data and this, the tools surface the insights for you. And you could see here that we asked, you know, are you using these? And the red is using now, the gray is no, but we're planning to use this in the next one to two years. And the gray is no, and we have no plans to do so. And you could see that at the time where we did the survey, which was at the end of 2019, about less than 25% of respondents were using any of these tools. But you could see this very, the light gray bar is just sticking out there in your face that um, that number is expected to double if users stick to their plans. Of course, users don't always stick to their plans. Um, and, you know, there are issues, especially now, you know, with sticking to plans. But, you know, that's um, this, there's definitely a huge amount of interest in the, these types of tools. I would caution that there are also risks associated, you know, with the tools in terms of not just accepting what comes out of them, you know, just willy nilly and, you know, they're not going to negate the need for understanding the, you know, the technology, how, how the algorithms sort of operate behind the scenes. I'm a big believer in, in understanding that because at the end of the day, even if you're a business analyst or a data scientist, you're going to have to defend your model and make sure that it makes sense. Um, so you're going to have to understand what's happening happening behind the scenes. You know, likewise, even for auto insights, you want to make sure that what these systems are coming up with makes some sense. Sometimes they don't actually make sense. Um, so if I had to say where the market is in 2020 pre-COVID, I would say that with regards to analytics technologies, you know, which was basically what I'm talking about here, that that where sort of many organizations are sort of in the middle of the road. You know, they're doing self-service, um, or at least they're moving towards self-service, and some of them are, you know, at the predictive analytics and machine learning phase or beyond that. But analytics maturity is is more than just about technology. It's it's about um, other things. It's about many other dimensions, um, and in order to utilize more advanced tools, organizations need to be ready in these five different dimensions that we have. We have analytics maturity models. As I said, we build assessments and one of the assessments we build is an analytics maturity assessment. You know, how mature are you? And we tend to look at this along five different dimensions. The organization dimension in terms of the culture and the leadership, the resources dimension in terms of funding and skills and talent the IT infrastructure dimension in terms of putting the right data infrastructure in place that's trusted and solid from which to do analytics. Of course, analytics maturity that I've been talking about from a technology perspective. And then the governance dimension, which is you know, critical about the rules and policies and procedures that an organization needs to put in place to make their analytics um, and data projects successful. And, you know, these are important in terms of organizations moving forward in, in analytics. And so what we see is that 
prior to COVID, there were a lot of challenges that organizations were facing. Um, the top challenge, one of the top challenges was around implementing the right data infrastructure to support analytics. You know, as organizations become more mature, they're collecting different data types. It's not just about structured data. They're also dealing, you know, with unstructured data like text data and semi-structured data. They're dealing with um, even image data and, and machine generated data. So trying to implement the right data infrastructure to support all of these is always a top challenge on the technology side. On, on the organizational side, obtaining buy-in um, is often a big problem that um, organizations face in terms of cultural issues, getting executive support, um, and you know, moving the needle forward. Um, on the technology side also, you've heard the whole 80-20 rule where organizations spend 80% of their time trying to assemble pipelines and put data together and preparing it for analysis and then 20% of their time actually doing the analysis, you know, that's an issue as well as, as I mentioned, integrating data for analysis. And, you know, in order to get value out of analytics, organizations want to operationalize it. As I mentioned, you know, putting their analytics into production, embedding them in dashboards more recently now, you know, trying to use more advanced analytics um, as, as part of something that others in the organization can see. And that can be a challenge as well. So, you know, we ask organizations, what would be some areas for improvement? And the things that they cite are things like better analytics culture, right, which can take time to develop that, that culture, more executive support, um, better data governance, because they're trying to balance this need for self-service across the whole analytics lifecycle with good data, you know, and to have good data, you need to govern the data, but to have self-service, you want to give people access to the data. So that's a big um, conundrum. And then training and data literacy are organizational areas for improvement that, um, that vendors, that um, a lot of respondents to our surveys cite. So this is sort of the backdrop of uh, where, where we are. Um, and, and, and now, you know, we're sort of into the April timeframe and with that backdrop, I want to talk about something that's greatly impacted um, organizations in the state of analytics in 2020 and that's COVID-19. So as we all know, COVID-19 has swept through the world and bringing upheaval uh, with it and it's, you know, impacted businesses, it's impacted most importantly lives and it's, it's certainly been painful for many. As part of our research at TDWI, we wanted to examine the specific impact of COVID-19 on data and analytics professionals. So we wanted to understand how the virus has affected data and analytics jobs, as well as the way these professionals work and the kind of work that they performed. So we developed the survey back in April, as I mentioned, and it was a global survey. It had about 250 respondents to it globally. What I'm going to show you here is the, are the U.S. results, and those U.S. results, um, about half of, half of the respondents were from the U.S. I will say, though, that um, most of what we saw in the U.S., we also saw um, overseas as well. So COVID-19 definitely throws a wrench into organizations. And, and you can see that here. I mean, we asked basic questions about overall layoffs and furloughs, and this was pretty early on. And in general, we saw that 25% of the respondents said that their organization had already experienced um, layoffs or furloughs. And another 50% said that there were freezes in terms of this is across the board. Um, so layoffs, furloughs, freezes, and for data and analytics professionals, um, let me look at my numbers here, 13% of data and analytics professionals said that their companies were either furloughing or laying off um, data and analytics people. And this was the case across industries and across company sizes. Now the majority, slightly over 50% of respondents were concerned about their jobs. Um, one respondent said, for example, I believe the return to normal time frame will be years, not months. So this is, person was absolutely correct in terms of, you know, what's, what's happening 
and, and this was back in the April, May timeframe. And she said the impact of this economic crisis will, is just uh -huh. begun to be felt now. The rest of the respondents though, oh, and that was over 40%, felt that their employers needed them now more than ever. Um, and in terms of hiring, 40% of the respondents stated that there was a freeze on hiring data and analytics professionals. I'll show you this in the next slide, I think. Just 5% said that they were hiring new staff during this crisis, so not necessarily good news um, for some people looking to um, find jobs. So we actually asked about specific impacts on data and analytics organizations. And we asked, aside from working from home, you know, what areas, what other aspects of your job have been impacted? And you could see the answers here. This was, this was basically about, you know, what, what aspects of the job had been frozen or canceled. I mean, clearly, uh, organizations were not um, necessarily traveling. So no travel for six months. That was the biggest uh, bar here. Although there was another bar that no travel for at least a year, so my guess is that you know we're more into that sort of year time frame or more. Um, the vast majority said that their employer did not want them to travel, and you could see that hiring for data, the data and the analytics function has been frozen or canceled. And forty percent, as I mentioned, said that some of the new projects, um, new analytics software, buying new analytics software or buying new data management software that were at about 30% there, so not terrible in terms of being frozen or canceled. Um, new analytics projects being frozen or canceled, that's, that's even less at about 20%. Um, training, because of course we're interested in training. So 20% you know, saying that their training budgets had been frozen or canceled. And you could see, if you're just reading down this list, that about 15% said that uh, that nothing had, only 15% said that nothing had been impacted. And then we also asked if working from home had any impact on the respondents' ability to do their jobs. And about 40% said that it had no impact. And you know, a lot of data and analytics professionals, sometimes they do work remotely. You know, a lot of people said it was fine to do that. Like one respondent said, you know, not at all. I've been working from home for over 10 years and were shocked that my lifestyle was termed quarantine. You know, some, organi some respondents felt that it was harder to collaborate with colleagues, um, but some, those who worked at home, you know, felt like sort of the playing field had been leveled in terms of being able to work with other colleagues, you know, in those who had been in the office remotely. So it, it sort of evened the playing field. You know, there were other things that people were com concerned about, you know, things like being able to set up VPN security, you know, that sort of thing for their data. In terms of how the nature of the work changed, I think this is where it gets really interesting. So we asked, due to COVID-19, how has the nature of your work changed? Um, and what we're hearing is that organizations are facing operational and strategic challenges, right? They have to do things like build new models to understand COVID. They're doing a lot more forecasting, for example. They're doing a lot more intelligent product substitution. They're trying to get the right products to the right areas. You know, in the healthcare industry, they're trying to prepare for new patients. Um, when new programs are come out, they're trying to detect fraud in new programs. So in retail, they're dealing with issues like inventory placement, better customer service. There's, we hear a lot about virtual um, agents being used, for example. You know, looking at spending um, patterns, they're looking at communities that are gonna be hit and, you know, and what that means to their supply chain and what that means to their forecast. Manufacturers are looking at what does the supply chain you know, look like. So the nature of the work has changed because the questions have changed. And you could see that here that, you know, a lot of the respondents said that they're being asked to answer new kinds of questions. Over 50% said that. And that means oftentimes that they're adding new attributes or features to their analyses. Um, you can see here that that's next, you know, down. So it's not just about the data that they had in in-house, they're actually trying to go out and get new data or at least add 
new features, you know, engineer new features. They're running their analytics more frequently. We're hearing that at least at the at initially. And of course, you know, models, if organizations were running predictive models, those models, um, what was true in the past may not be true in the future. So that they're needing to update their models and other analytics. Uh, you can see here that they're saying they're frequently revising revenue forecasts. And as I mentioned, um, up close to 30, 30 percent were already incorporating new data sources into their data systems. And you could see that only like 20 something percent said that the nature of their work hasn't changed. Some were saying, you know, oh, we have to do more with less and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, there was some op opportunities here too. A lot of people commented, and I've heard this, you know, also anecdotally is that we're finally getting to do analytics, you know, or we're not just sort of building reports and dashboards, we're finally getting to do more analysis. Um, and that the visibility of the analysis is increasing because it's becoming, it, it's so important. So, you know, these are some of the changes that we're seeing. And, you know, what really this is leading to, and what we're seeing anecdotally is that digital transformation, this digital transformation, that many organizations were on the path to, you know, which means in this case, we're talking about integrating digital technology into businesses. Um, if you think about past waves of digital transformation, that includes things like the internet wave in the 90s, in the 1990s, you know, the e-commerce wave in, in the early 2000s, like actually changing how you're doing business using um, digital technologies. This current wave that we're in now is about data and analytics being at the heart of um, of this, you know, everyone talks about AI and those technologies being sort of at the heart of how businesses can operate and provide value. And so, what we see typically in our surveys is, you know, over ninety percent, ninety five percent of organizations will say, "Yeah, we know that we need to digitally transform in order to compete. We got to get our data infrastructure in order. We have to, you know, be moving forward with more advanced analytics." But what we see happening is that this acceleration is, um, it's accelerating, the digital transformation is accelerating. What we're seeing things like more organizations are um, moving up their time to move to the cloud so that they get the scale up and scale out benefits of the cloud. As I mentioned, we're seeing new data types used. Um, organizations want to get at, you know, maybe they want to get at weather data that they weren't able, that they wanted to use, a retail organization might want to use that to build some sort of um, model, or, you know, they want to get at the COVID data to understand how it's impacting different parts of the country and what that means um, in terms of, of their operations. And that organizations are relying on data-driven decisions and analytics um, more often. So, so that's you know what we see actually happening in terms of um guiding principles you know what should organizations be considering as they move forward in this new normal i want to talk about a few guiding principles and, and what we see so you know now organizations are dealing with constantly changing conditions and they're going to need to understand where they are now and plan for how to move forward in a dynamic environment um, this includes things like gaining insights into customer behaviors that impacts products and pricing, optimizing supply chains, um, updating revenue forecasts. You know, this is all the bread and butter of analytics. It's also gonna include, um, as you plan for the new normal, you're gonna have to examine the current work workforce, um, production, you know, service strategies, and how to come out of COVID-19 stronger and more agile. You know, Boston Consulting Group has a lot of good research on this 14% of organizations that actually managed to thrive in, in economic downturns. And, um, you know, they often use, um, they're actually able to increase their sales growth and profit margins, oftentimes, you know, utilizing analytics um, to help with this. So they're, they're able to sort of get ahead of it. And so I would, I, I, I would suggest, you know, people, if you're concerned about that, to look at some of their research. They have some good research, you know, on that to come to come out of this sort of being stronger and more agile. As I was mentioning, 
at TDWI, we certainly had to pivot. We held a lot of week, we typically held week long events um, with half day courses where we train data and analytics professionals, you know, on, on, as I said, on a wealth of things. So we had to pivot, you know, rapidly and um, move mostly to virtual, changing our business models and, and everything else. Um, we obviously needed data and analytics to do that. And, you know, we were able to get out ahead of, um, ahead of it, I think, um, in a pretty good way. But, you know, it's all about understanding how you're going to use the data and analytics to help with your operations, your workforce, you know, optimizing your supply chain, um, dealing, understanding your customers um, better, because especially consumer behavior has changed dramatically uh, during this time as well. So there's some new practices that I think are important and I'll talk about some new practices and some new technologies. Um, you know, one of the new, and, and, and it's not really a new practice, it's sort of a best practice, you know, is being able to understand and, and align with the business. This is now more important than ever. Pre-COVID, when we ask what's the best practice that you would tell others embarking on an analytics journey, you know, one of the top best practices was always about business and IT sort of coming together and understanding the business and solving real business problems. Well, there's a lot of real business problems now, so this understanding and aligning with the business becomes even more important. And organizations need to become more proactive, like the Boston Consulting Group says, that the winners are going to reinvent um, themselves by putting data and analytics at the core of what they're doing. But it's also about being proactive. So for example, um, accessing data and using more advanced analytics like machine learning to be able to predict demand and match supply to demand and um, allocating inventory properly and that sort of thing. Um, what a lot of experts are saying is that it's important for organizations to be able to predict and plan for issues before they actually occur, you know, and that gives them room to navigate um, the disruptions in advance. Um, for example, on the consumer side, you know, you think about how COVID-19 is changing how consumers behave, you know, basically across many aspects of um, their life. And uh, another good source is to look at McKinsey, you know, is talking about the fact that everything about the consumer is going to change and that organizations that want to succeed need to be able to get ahead or at least survive, you know, need to be able to get ahead of what they want. And, you know, remember, you know, they, they did get ahead with things like curbside pickup and, and so on. I mean, in terms of retail, which was certainly one, organi one vertical that was definitely struggling during this time, it was important for retail <clears throat> to use analytics to sort of read the signals of how consumer behaviors are changing, right? How may people maybe are buying things more online, they may be buying more in bulk, you know, and then based on the changing consumer behavior, it's about changing strategy and pricing and promotions and marketing. And then based on that, looking to see if there's a positive or negative response from consumers. And so you're sort of always analyzing and always adjusting um, when needed, and you have contingency plans, you know, in terms of supporting, you know, a good case scenario, a medium case scenario, a worst case scenario. So that's what a, a lot of these organizations are doing now. You know, they're trying to analyze their data. They're trying to do it more rapidly, trying to do it, you know, um, um, on a continuous type of basis so they can make adjustments uh, as, as needed. And you know, there's also some technology if if the budget exists. Um, you know, automation can also be helpful. I think in some ways during this time. And as I mentioned, you know, we see automation across the 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 entire analytics lifecycle from data quality. You know, which I mentioned, to classifying data, sensitive data, um, helping to build pipelines and then automate those pipelines and reuse them doing things like identifying metadata um, where machine learning can go in and actually identify, you know, what it looks like is the metadata, which becomes very important in terms of data access uh, to help populate, say, data catalogs 
that way so people can go in and, and be able to understand their data better, find out where it is, um, see rated data so that they can get access to trusted data. I mentioned model building. Some of these tools even do automated feature engineering. And then of course, being able to look at um, a model doesn't stay uh, fresh forever, it's gonna get stale. And so you need to be able to look for model degradation. So we see these technologies um, being used across the life cycle. In today's world, you know, too, there are organizations that since people are at home more, they are using, you know, automated technologies to help, like Facebook is using automated um, technologies, whereas they might have had human, human um, people reviewing um, content on Facebook. They're using more automated technologies now to be able to look for um, issues with with comments. Um, there's a number of examples like that. So the, the automation is helping to increase productivity. Um, in some cases, replacing the human, but you know, helping to sort of streamline this process. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dana and let's see what questions we have. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Halper, for your uh, perspective and uh, on trend insights in both the industry and also the effect of COVID on organizations and their analytics. Um, first question, uh, so how is AI being used to address new issues as a result of COVID-19? Um, is it helping? Um, yeah, there's there's numerous numerous examples of AI actually being used. I mean, some I mentioned. Um, there's companies, healthcare companies. I mentioned that they were sort of behind the curve. Although, of course, there were many opportunities for AI even before COVID nineteen um, for healthcare companies. But now we're seeing some healthcare companies um, do things like using predictive modeling to determine which patients are at risk. Um, for outreach um, purposes during COVID. So like the medical home network is one example, you know, where they built predictive models to be able to identify which patients were more at risk. And it wasn't just about their medical, um, you know, their medical history. I think it also included some social, you know, behavior types of activities to be able to reach out that a huge audience, to be, a huge audience of patients, a huge group of patients to reach out there, I mentioned, um, oh, you know, automated security monitoring, right, with IT people not being in the office. Um, a lot more cyber security is happening. Um, you know, certainly we heard about this with, you know, early on with some of the um, testing, you know, where AI was actually being used uh, to help develop tests for COVID, and it's also being used to help develop vaccines for COVID as well. So a number of areas uh, there that I think, um, you know, companies that are being very innovative and using these technologies to help to, to drive value there. Okay. And then, you know, speaking of, of automating, automating and automating tools, uh, what are your thoughts on the safety of uh, automated tools? Are they safe to use in, in terms of of accuracy and reliability. Oh, okay. So that so that's about the like the automated machine learning types. Yeah, of automated data quality and right. So people are saying, yeah, you should be using these tools if you can't hire new people and you want to upskill your business analysts to be data scientists. You want to do more predictive analytics, and you have some budget. And by the way, some of these uh, vendors are providing free access to their tools during this time, or at least some trials to try things with. Um, you know, and if you want to use open source, if the business analysts are up for that, although there isn't as much automated machine learning there. Um, yeah, so automated machine learning is being touted as something that organizations might consider during this time to increase the productivity of the data scientists and to help the data, the business analysts and technical analysts use the tools. And as I mentioned, I think it's great. I mean, the tools I've used a lot of them. I mean, sometimes they come up with good stuff. Sometimes the stuff, sometimes the results don't make any sense, you know, which is why I think it's really important. And I, I alluded to this before that 
those who are going to use the tools still understand um, the, the algorithms behind the scenes. So not only understand the algorithms, but sort of understand the output and you know what an ROC curve means or, or whatever. Um, vendors are trying to get better at this. They're trying to provide tools on the back end to help with things like explainability um, and bias, because a lot of bias, if you don't know what you're doing, a lot of bias can also happen in these models. That's a whole talk um, in and of itself. Um, but yeah, I think you got to be really careful. And I'm, I'm happy to see when these tools first came out, vendors were saying, oh, you know, any business user can use it. Like basically anyone off the street could use it. But now they seem to be changing their tune in terms of, um, you know, providing training and helping people get on board with some of these. I know when I was at Bell Labs, some of the early machine learning algorithms were coming out and, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to sort of attend even like a couple day course, you know, to understand what a decision tree was all about and how to interpret the output of a decision tree model, how it compared to other models, you know, that, that sort of thing. And um, so I'm, it's not, I'm not saying you have to go out and get a university degree, although it's great if you can, because I think that that's, you know, great if you can, that's like the best. But um, if your company won't pay for that or whatever, then, you know, there's ways to at least get familiar with these algorithms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so we just got a, a new one. Uh, so more, more around the organization. So how challenging should it look um, for an organization that doesn't have analytics uh, or didn't have analytics in the past starts to adopt the change? And uh, what aspects of should the organization um, look at first, um, first as, as a first priority? Well, okay, so if you don't have analytics to begin with, I mean, I'm assuming that some people are using spreadsheets, um, at least at a minimum. So there's some people that may be able to do some analysis and it, you know I think you have to walk before you can fly so you know in that case you know you'd be starting off with some of um, even tools that help you better understand where you are and then be able to provide you know even reporting or dashboard dashboard types of tools because I'm sure executives are asking for this um, you know to to executives to help them understand how key KPIs are changing, you know, that might be something, of course, I mean, I don't know where the, where the, the people are in their journey in terms of data as well. And obviously, um, they have to think about what questions they need answered, you know, what questions are going to have impact, what data they have to answer those questions, where the data is, can they get at that data, you know, is, is their quality data, I mean, basically, they're going to have to put together some sort of plan, but I will say this, that even organizations, um, you know, what we typically see happening in organizations is, is a virtuous circle, basically, or a virtuous cycle. Maybe it's a virtuous circle, I guess, yeah, where, um, you know, someone starts off doing something with analytics, you know, moving past the spreadsheet sort of stage, and I don't mean to downgrade spreadsheets. Um, I use spreadsheets, um, and there are certainly tools that vendors have that provide spreadsheet like interfaces because people are used to using that it's all it's all about sort of the data that's that's underneath and having a common set of data you know across the enterprise that's where we see organizations getting value so you know they're going to have to go through a series a series of steps um and I, I it there may be difficulty i would suggest if they have executive that can help them you know get started with that if there's resources you know that would be that would be great they can you know come to tdwi take our assessment you know see where they are um we have guides in terms of getting started and that sort of thing so that may help yeah i think that that makes sense yeah thank you for that question and that answer as well um, if anyone still has some questions we we do still have some time um but a uh, few more to answer. Uh, so one here, we did see that, you know, there obviously were a lot of organizations that were adopting more analytics, but this question is, how do I convince my boss that more analytics are needed, not less during COVID-19? Okay. 
um, yeah, that's always an issue that that we see. Everyone, we run a lot of, well, we did, I should say, we did run before COVID. We would run a lot of strategy summits um, with practitioners and managers, and that always came up and, and in terms of how to get them on board. And it's not it's not necessarily something that's going to happen overnight. I mean, typically, if you don't have an executive who's already on board with analytics and, and you know, actually on board, because sometimes they'll say that they're on board, but they really don't get it, if, if you know what I mean. Um, but, you know, there, there can be a sort of a bottom-up type of movement where a VP of analytics or a director of analytics um, will sort of do their diligence or even in the IT department and sort of go from door to door and get people sort of singing on the same page, you know, and then that along with the facts, bringing that to um, the people for funding, you know, start to get some funding, start to put some minimal things in place, you know, and then that again starts to build on each other. I would suggest that if, in terms of the analytics, like if you say want to start off building, you haven't done predictive analytics and you want to start doing predictive analytics, it would make sense to select a problem where you're already measuring, you have some metrics associated with, you know, that specific, that specific problem space. So when you start using predictive analytics, you can actually see how what you're doing compares to what was happening before so that you can measure impact. You know, that's a way a lot of organizations help to get their programs off the ground even more, you know, just by saying, hey, you know, look, we, it was this, we did this, this is what happened, it had this impact, it affected this metric this way. So those are some of the things that organizations can think about a problem where you can measure impact, but of course is doable. And so I would suggest, you know, going to your management and saying, I think I can do this, or, you know, I'm hearing that you have this problem. You know, a lot of people go door to door and ask what the problems are and try to gather together what that is and, and then pick one and, and start to do something about it. Okay. I just had another one come in and, uh, you know, the, the question is, uh, in, in your opinion, uh, you know, I guess this is the perspective of a, a data scientist or, or maybe an analyst. Is it necessary to be good at both R and Python or only either? Um, just one would be fine. Well I, well, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a data scientist and she said she was very proficient in R, but she said, I feel like a dinosaur. Like I need to know Python, you know, like if you want to develop apps, you know, because it's more of a language, um, you know, then then use Python um, or, you know, it's like a library of tools. I remember when I was at Bell Labs, we used S plus, which was the precursor to R and, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like a bunch of um, tools. Of course, R has come a long way, but I think the reason that we see Python outpacing R is because, you know, organizations sort of see its value um, early on with R when, if, if people were building predictive models and trying to put them into production, it was more difficult you know, say than with, with Python. So that's my opinion for what it's worth. I mean, what we see honestly is organizations using both R and Python and commercial products, you know, the sort of, uh, when data scientists come in, they have a bunch of different tools, but you know, whereas R and Python are great for people who know how to code, you know, other people, you know, they don't have the coders mindset and, you know, and honestly, we're just starting to see some really good tools out of the open source community to deal with the back end of predictive analytics and machine learning. So, so, you know, everyone's been focused on the front end of actually building the model. They haven't actually been thinking about putting those models into production and operationalizing them. So an open source is far behind on this. That's my opinion. And um, so what we see is a lot of organizations using commercial and open source tools together. And look, a lot of organizations don't want to use open source tools, you know, because the reality is if there are compliance um, issues in the organization, you know, depending on their industry, they want to be able to point the finger at, I mean, this sounds terrible, but you know, if there's a problem, you know, they need something that's documented. They don't want software that could 
you know, change on the fly, basically, you know, they want to be able to say, well, this is what the, this software vendor provided. This is what the problem with it was, you know, here's the documentation, et cetera, et cetera. So we definitely see organizations that are more advanced using both the open source and the commercial products together. Okay. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so with this one, uh, what are the priorities for organizations during COVID-19 in, in terms of analytics? Yeah, I've seen some studies on this and um, it seems like the top priorities are around, you know, what you would expect, I guess, you know, sort of the operational end and putting their analytics to operational use, but also, you know, really using the analytics to understand customer behavior. So like doing things like optimizing your supply chain, but really understanding your customers because customer behavior, everything that you thought um, was true pre-COVID um, may change post-COVID and into this new normal, the patterns that, you know, we see now, you know, may, may subsist for a while. I don't think that people are necessarily rushing to get back to their previous patterns. And if they do, you still have to know that. So the customer behavior thing is really important. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, we, we have two minutes left. Um, so yeah, I think we are out of time for questions, but uh, for any unanswered questions, um, this is a recorded session and uh, we will be distributing so we, we can answer um, you know, whatever was left here, uh, as well as um, you know, contacting um, Fern Helper directly um, by email, um, which you see on the screen here. Um, at this point, um, you know, I, I hope to again see you um, in two weeks for our last talk of the series where um, Lawrence will share his experience in Southwest Texas which, uh, as we all know, has been a particular area of concern with the COVID-19 crisis. I also want to take this time to thank the decision analytics team um, at the BCU School of Business, um, Brittany Grasick, uh, Gabby Oliveira, Rachel Kaiser, Dr. Paul Brooks, and Dr. Steve Custer uh, for organizing these sessions. And also a big thank you again to Dr. Halper and to all of you for attending and participating in this series. So with that, we we'll hope to see you in, in two weeks. Thank you.